Hey everybody, it's Mark. I'm back with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And before I get to our amazing guest this week, I want to remind everybody to go to my website to find out some really cool stuff that's going on. Okay, number one, uh, we've got over 175 podcasts every single week for the last couple of years. They're inspiring, they're amazing, they're about people overcoming incredible odds and doing incredible and amazing and awesome and everything any other word you could come up with great things that are on there but um would really appreciate if you came on and uh to my website www.markpattisonnfl.com and went to that tab and gave the show a ratings and review it really does help out in terms of the the popularity of the show on itunes that's where it's all about and uh We continue to get lifts from many different people, almost uh, 100,000 downloads now after uh, 175 episodes. So that is greatly appreciated. Okay, also, I will be off to Mount Everest March 31st, 2021. Right now, the mountain is open. I am planning to go there, continuing to train like crazy. And there is a blog on that website that you can actually follow me going up and down the mountain with a little device called Garmin that can help track my progress, which is pretty cool. And the last thing is I'm sitting here today with my guest here at Higher Ground. Higher Ground is located in Sun Valley, Idaho. And I'm really, really uh, blessed, grateful, fortunate. We started a campaign, Amelia's Everest, the Lotsi Challenge. And the goal has been to raise 17, I'm sorry, $27,940 bucks and we have raised 17,000 um, plus dollars to date. We just got a uh, social grant from the NFL which is really amazing and and the people at Higher Ground, Erin uh, is out there. She's helping a lot with with many of the things that we're trying to do. And um, and so anyways, we continue to help people with cognitive issues. My daughter Amelia has epilepsy. Higher Ground helps many of the military folk that have cognitive issues, uh, PTSD or other things that um, have to do with really um, adaptive sports and helping those soldiers coming back. They've done so many great things for us to help them find their way. Okay, so check that out, www.markpattisonnfl.com, and you can get all that info there. All right, on to the pod of the day. Uh, We have a guy by the name of Brian Von Herbalist. Brian, how you doing? Great, Mark. Thanks for uh, for having me today. Yeah, no. Th- today we find ourselves uh, in mid November here. Uh, the one of the the big attractions for me in Sun Valley is that it suns three hundred days of the year, and this is the one day it, it takes me back to my hometown of Seattle, Washington. It's very damp. <laughs> yeah, a little gloomy today. It's a little gloomy. It's a little gloomy, but you know, it's always a sunny day here in in Sun Valley. Um, for me, at least, you know, having to be in a great community surrounded by the mountains. And as we can see out the window, there's a lot of snow um, and the temperatures are supposed to uh, reduce again and, and uh, a lot of a lot of snowfall and the opening of next weekend. Thanksgiving is coming around the corner. Uh, hopefully they're going to be able to open the mountain and, and the skiers um, on their way. But I know you're you're from Boise and I want to talk to you about a lot of things. You've got a lot of cool things and I and I, I want to take a slight right hand turn what I normally talk to people about in terms of, you know, there's been a lot of horrific things of people losing their eyesight or there's an arm or a leg or they've been burned or something like that and how they've come back from that. And 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 you've got this amazing military background. I do want to get into that and and all the things that you learned um, through that leadership. And, and the things that you're doing today and really pinpointing some of the ways that you're helping organizations really grow and be much more um, efficient. There's a personal statement that, uh, that I saw that you have, uh, which is to be an honorable man and enrich the lives of others. And I think really at the end of the day, that's what life is all about. Yeah, so, um, you know, I heard somebody once mention their personal mission statement. And uh, that made me think, you know, what am I doing on this planet? What am I doing with my life? And what is my mission here right now? And that mission statement can change over time. But uh, right now, when I developed that personal mission statement, was just a couple months ago. And um, in reflection, I thought about how I want to live my life, what I want to be doing, what I want to be thought of by my family, by my friends, by those that I encounter 
And it is simply to be an honorable man. And the word honor to me has so many connotations to it. You know, it's kind of an umbrella term for all the facets of my life that I want to exercise and showcase to people. You know, it is about being a person of integrity, knowing and living by your values and principles. It's about who you surround yourself with uh, and making sure you are loyal to those people that you've committed to and being in a positive relationship with. It's about being trustworthy. It's about being confident. It's about being humble when that is the right approach. It's about being genuine. It's about being authentic to who you really are uh, and finding purposeful ways to live your life. So that's why I choose to be an honorable person. But then when you are honorable, you are a reflection to other people and you give them perhaps perspective on how they can approach life and live their lives. And that's where the enriching the lives of others. So my personal mission statement is to be an honorable man and enrich the lives of others. And that's what I find myself doing these days. Yeah, that's awesome. So I think one of the things about that, and, and, you know, as I reflect back, I couldn't have said that in terms of going out, trying to raise money. I've done it multiple times now. And, and, um, it's something that's come later in my life to re- recognize about the helping others. And so all those characteristics that you just talked about and you put in this bottle and you shake it around and out comes this wonderful person, right? Which is work, right? Yeah. Totally. I don't, I don't think you always just wake up grateful and all the other things that fall under the umbrella, um, of being honorable, but like, how does somebody get there? Right. What are what are the what's the tool set that you need to help create this person? I think a lot of it goes back um, and it's about reflection, like who impacted you in life and how did you take those lessons learned in your journey of life and look at those people that had an impact on you? What did they do right? What did you learn from them and how do you want to move forward projecting that same thing? I look back at my own life and think about the people that had tremendous impact on where I am today and how I got there. Uh, And I'm so grateful for them. And they were such strong, such honorable people for me to follow as mentors to me. And that's where it starts. I think it starts in reflection. As you move on in life, as you get a little bit older, a little bit wiser, a little bit more mature. So you think about those that had an impact on you and what it's done for you in a positive way. But then you think back about the opportunities you had to impact others and whether you did it right or whether you made a mistake in your approach to those people. So you're constantly learning, iterating in your own life and processes, and then having that positive impact going forward. And I spent a career in the military and there is no greater opportunity to shape young lives as an officer of Marines and so when I look back at all those encounters I had with thousands of, mar- of Marines, you know, did I do things right? Was I honorable in my approach to them and how I treated them and what I taught them, how I prepared them, how I trained them? And then how did I discipline them? You know, I had those authorities as well as I got more mature in rank in the Marine Corps. Uh, and those are a facet of military life. So as I look at those things and reflect on them, there are so many lessons for me to now carry forward. Yeah, no, I love that. A lot to unpack right there. So the first thing is, is that um, from a reflection standpoint, I think the different stages of life that we all go through, and I seem to to break it down in, in groups of 10, right? Every 10 years, you kind of got a new thing, you know, yeah. going on, right? And I can certainly do that for my life. And I think earlier in the in, in the game of life for me, I was so busy moving forward and trying, my, trying to make my mark in the world and everything else that I really didn't understand what reflection meant, Yeah. right? And I think that's the problem with so many different people. One of the things, 100%, that's happened in the last 10 years for me is that I've gone through some big life changes. A lot of people on the podcast have heard this from me before in terms of my long-term relationship with my wife and that broke apart and try, really trying to like reinvent myself and recreate what life was going to look like going forward. And, and, and 
And because technology is now with us, whereas technology, when I was growing up in Seattle, Washington, it was three TV channels, and the rest of the time you're out in the playground, you know, with your buddies playing football, basketball, baseball, whatever the sport of the season um, was, is really forced me um, by moving to Sun Valley as well, being in nature, being unplugged, and really going through that whole thoughtful process like you were talking about of the mentors to me, my dad, my grandfather, coaches, all that kind of stuff. So that's one thing. The second thing that you talked about was being in the in the military with the Marines. So totally hats off to you in terms of your service to America and 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 helping to keep, you know, us in the in the safe zone versus a lot of the chaos that's going on around the world. Um I think one of the things that there's a common bond between when you're in sports like I was and with you being in the military is you have those mentors, those coaches, those disciplinarians that are really there. They've been taught from their coaches, from their mentors, from their sergeants, their colonels, you know, whatever the the rank is um, on what the right way and the wrong way to do things in life is. You know, there's always a, a scale in there for you know, adaptability based on that personality. But at the end of the day, there's like the core rule set, yeah. right? And and so th- when 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 you came out of, I'm asking this question because I don't know the answer. Did you come out of high school? Did you go to college? I mean, what was the path for you to get there? And, and there's, I've had a lot of people, a lot of guys uh, on the pod that have been in the military. And each one, there was a certain reason they were either in a bad situation or their grandfather had been in the military. You know, there's something that, you know, led them to that yeah. conclusion. Well, so I don't have a tremendous, you know, military lineage in my family. My grandfather was a Navy corpsman, so a medic in World War II, stitching up Marines on the beaches in the Pacific. But like so many of that World War II generation, uh, he came home and suffered tremendously in his mind, um, and he struggled in life. Um, so I never really saw the military in such a positive way. I knew it had a really negative impact on my grandfather. I grew up an athlete, and I had dreams of being a professional baseball player uh, and put the majority of my time and effort into that. And unfortunately, in that process, suffered some injuries and, and lack of talent, You know, never made it to the big leagues in baseball. Played in college. But when I was in college, my parents got divorced my sophomore year of college. So I'd been married 25 years and got divorced. And I came home for Christmas break to find out that they had split. And nobody bothered to tell me. Hmm. So in my mind, I became irrelevant to them. You know, or for whatever reason, nobody thought it was important to tell me this was happening. Um, so I came home to a different dynamic. My dad had moved out. Christmas was different. Uh, and I became different at that point. I was jaded. I was angry. I was lost. And I went back to school, not to go to school. I was unfocused, undisciplined, and I partied like a rock star. Mm-hmm. And baseball fell apart. My grade point average, I think, that semester, that following semester, was like a .07. I didn't even go to class. I don't even know how I got the .07. I was just lost. You know, here I am maturing, you know, um, but really I was falling apart. So when I talked about mentors, um, this is where they became really important because I ended up getting kicked out of college. I went home and quickly had to figure out what it means to grow up. I had no family structure, no unit there. My siblings... We're all kind of freaking out at the same time. So a good friend of mine's dad kind of took me under his wing, gave me some odd jobs, and and I went to school. I worked full time and then worked for my friend's dad. Uh, And one day he came to me and said, what's it going to take for you to go back to school and complete what you started? And I said about 10,000 bucks. And he's like, done. I'll give you 10 grand. Go back to school and finish school. You're too good to be living the way you're living. So that started a mental process for me that somebody beyond an athletic coach Mm -hmm. was taking an interest in me. And his interest in me really went back to childhood when I protected his kid, his son on the playground in elementary school. Um, And that's a whole long story, but he took an interest in me 
and he helped me find a path to get back to school. And I had to scratch and claw to get back, but I made that my goal in life to get back into that school, graduate from that school. And he forged a path and the president of that college, who was a retired army three-star general, one of Merrill's marauders from World War II, I mean, just a legend in the military, uh, General Sam Wilson. Uh, I had to meet with him because the director of admissions wouldn't let me in. They told me no way. So what college is this? This is Hamden Sydney College in Virginia. In Virginia. It's in central Virginia. It's kind of tucked into the middle of tobacco fields. It's one of the oldest institutions um, south of the Mason-Dixon. 1776 is when it was founded. So, so as you're answering this question, I want you to sprinkle this in. Yeah. I want you. I want to understand if if I'm going to turn around and give somebody ten grand. Yeah. Right. Then there's always the motivation behind it, right? If I go out and I work for something, and I pay for it, I've earned that. Yep. Right. And 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 for me to turn around, I'd really want a compelling answer, versus just say, you know, the quick answer is sure, I'll I'll finish. Yep. And what was that about your answer? And what was it about your answer to this admission, famous yeah. war hero yep. that let, got you back in the in the club? Yeah. So my friend's dad put a qualifier on the ten grand. He said, "Look, I will give it to you, but you have one year to pay me back." So I saw it as a challenge. Nobody had challenged me in a long time, so that sparked me. I was a Tough kid. I love to challenge. People told me I couldn't do things. That's what drove me. Because hmm. when I was a little kid, there was no way I was going to be an athlete. I was born with two feet that were messed up and had to wear braces on my legs. I had to wear an eye patch as a kid because my eyes were so bad that I was just, I was messed up physically. And so my parents never thought I'd be an athlete, but that was a challenge. I did it. And I played at the high levels. I made every all-star team. I was the captain of every team I played on with heart and grit. So here's a guy who gave me a challenge and I took him up on it. And then the general who was the president of this college, when I had to meet with him and beg his permission to overturn the admissions director's decision, he challenged me and he said, okay, stud, I will allow you back in for one semester. And if you make Dean's list, I'll let you graduate. If you are off by .0001 on Dean's List qualification, you'll never set foot on this campus again. And what is Dean's List? So I had to make a, I think it was a 3.3 GPA that semester. Okay. And I had to take a pretty hefty course load. And I was two credit hours short. And the general said, how about you do an independent study for me? You pick the topic. And I had already done my homework on him. And I said, how about counterterrorism? And he said, done, we'll study that together. So again, two people who put a challenge in front of me is what sparked me to, to carry forward, to graduate from that school and then move on in a productive way in life. Incredible story, incredible story. Okay, so you make it through, you made the Dean's List. Yeah, I made Dean's right? List, I graduated, high five. And yeah. uh, then I had to figure out well, now what? Well, I was just going to ask a question. So you, you do that, right? And, and I would equate this in, in one level of, you know, I played the NFL, and then five years later, after doing this really competitively for over 10, because I was in college, I was in a uh, redshirt, so a five-year plan, and then go through the draft and, and uh, get drafted and then playing and all that kind of, So now you're at the end, and you go off the high, you know, the cliff, right? And you're saying to yourself, okay, now what? Right. And, yep. you, and at the same time, in, in my circumstance, I thought, you know, just because of where I'd been, I'd have a lot of people come and saying, hey, come work for me. And there wasn't anybody calling. And so I seriously had to figure it out on my, my own. But for you, what was that like? I mean, it's just like you've you've accepted this challenge. You've you've done it not only for this friend's father. Right. And you can look him in the eye and pay him back. But you've also made a dean's list and, and you fulfilled your promise to the to the general. Yep. Right? So I I accomplished that. I'm now at that college graduate stage of life, you know, and uh, 
And I had to figure out the now what. And I floundered about. I kind of job hopped. Um, but I made enough money to work towards paying my, my friend back. And, but I was lost again. And I needed a challenge. And that's where, you know, my dad had talked to me in some turbulent times about, man, you just, you need to go in the military. You are driven that way and you should explore it. Now, now before you go there, I want to go back to, you came home, it was over Christmas. You yeah. didn't know that your parents had split. Now they split. Yep. And you're pissed off. Yeah. Right. And you're lost and you're going through all the emotions that probably my kids went through too. Yeah. Right, when all that happened. And so now, now it's two or three or a year, or whatever that time period is, you go back to your dean's list, you graduate, everybody's high-fiving, now what moment? Yep. Was there still animosity or, or towards your dad? In other words, was it hard to hear that message of whatever his advice had been just because of the, the pot, I'm making this up, the grudge that you may still have based yeah. on the way that he transitioned out of the marriage? No, I I still um, respected a lot of things about both of my parents. You know, their turbulence was their turbulence. And I had had enough time to reflect and say, look, w what transpired in my family dynamics, like, it happened. But I got to move forward in a positive way. So when I had those times of engagement with both of my parents, they were positive. And I just, I realized that I had grown up now to a degree um, but I, I had more to do and I needed to find that environment because my parents were no longer the ones providing that for me. And that's what kind of led me to the military. My dad said, you should go in that direction. And that's all he said, which sparked my interest in figuring out what that might look like. Hmm. Okay. So now you can, uh, you, you've got choices, right? And there's the Marines, there's the Army, there's the Navy, yeah. right? So, so how did you land on the Marines is where I want to be? Yeah, so I, um, I explored the Navy because I had a good friend who um, was a Navy SEAL, had been injured in training and, uh, and paralyzed in training. But um, he joined later in life, kind of where I was. You know, I was now pushing 25 and I had watched his process and him mature in the SEALs. And, uh, and I lived his, you know, listened to his stories and really appreciated it. But uh, Navy life wasn't going to be for me. I always looked at the Marine Corps as the grit, just tough fighters that loved every challenge you could ever, ever throw at them. They're like rabid dogs, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, that's what I was drawn to, you know. I didn't know anybody in the Marine Corps. I just wanted what in my mind appeared to be the toughest, the greatest challenge, the mystery around the Marine Corps and that esprit de corps and all the things I loved in my athletic teams is what I was craving. And I thought the Marine Corps was probably going to provide it better than any other service. Now, there, was there a, a, a period of time where you figure this out? So now you're answering the question of now what? Yeah, and you are you, you sign up, and they say, okay, you got to be here on December fifteenth, whatever the day it was, right? And and now the the real come to Jesus moment happens, where you're in there, you're locked in for a period of time, and now they got to break you down to build you back up, right? Yep. And 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 at that point, were you understanding that, or were you? It was just like, what the hell have I done? Yeah, well, again, just chasing that ultimate challenge. I recognized there was going to be this new model of life, but I also knew that's what I needed. Like I, I craved that structure. I missed athletics so much and team dynamics so much that I was ready for anything they had to throw at me. The unfortunate part was that I got rejected by the Marine Corps initially. Hmm. I initially went to see an enlisted recruiter because I had no idea about the process of joining the Marine Corps. Uh, I didn't know there were officer recruiters for college graduates. So I saw this enlisted recruiter and we had, you know, the typical recruiter conversation. Uh, and then he asked me why I wasn't talking to an officer recruiter and I didn't know they existed. So he put me in touch with the officer recruiter and told me what that life would be more like. And he thought I was probably more suited to go that way. But then I got rejected 
because there were so many candidates in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. So I had to face the challenge of figuring out. Like I was super deflated. I had this pathway, got rejected, and now I'm back to now what? And uh, I came up with a plan to kind of outsmart the system. I thought about the challenge, the, the areas of the country where the Marine Corps probably had the hardest time recruiting. Mm. And I packed up my bags and I moved to Berkeley, California. Okay. And I found the recruiter, the officer recruiter in a little town called Alameda, yeah. right there on the water. And I walked into his office, put the same package down on his desk. And you would have thought I was manna from heaven. You know, I ran a perfect fitness score. Uh, I was super motivated, ready to go. Oh. And uh, he was struggling to meet his quotas. So he and I were a, a perfect marriage. So I... I then got accepted through him. So, man, I was so hungry and ready. Whatever the Marine Corps had to offer me, I was ready to absorb and and suck all that up and really move on in life. Okay, so you 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 pack up, you 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 move to Berkeley, California, yep. uh, Alameda, which is down by the the Raider old facility now. It's in Las Vegas. Yeah, um, and and. And now what? So you get accepted and now what? Yeah. So then I drive back cross country six months later and I show up in Quantico, Virginia, where Marine Corps officer candidate school is. And they do it a couple different ways. But the program I was accepted into was a 10 straight week program where you have Marine Corps drill instructors and you're you're with a company of other candidates. Some of them are prior enlisted and some of them are just college graduates that are showing up into this military culture for the first time. So it was a really interesting process. I, I quickly made friends with the guys that were prior enlisted. They knew the deal. They had been to Marine Corps enlisted boot camp, So they knew what to expect from drill instructors. And I just watched them and made friends with them and observed what they did and why they did certain things. I asked a lot of questions uh, when we weren't responding to all the things the drill instructors were throwing at us. And uh, those were the guys that I, I really started to develop relationships with and, and bond with. And by doing that, I quickly learned the rights and wrongs and the ways to get through this, this training regimen to get you to become a second lieutenant and officer in the Marine Corps. Uh, going back to what you originally were talking about when we were talking about what it takes to be an honorable man, yep. uh, one thing that I always see that is associated with that statement is success leaves clues, right? And so what you were just talking about is is there's other guys in there who kind of been there before you and to really understand, wait a minute, those guys are doing it the right way and I need to follow those guys because those guys know the right path. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you've had a long career, but in 2005, 2006, you were deployed to Afghanistan. What was that experience like for you? I can't even, you know, we're here in Sun Valley. We're looking out the window. I'm looking at this beautiful ski mountain. Even though it's a little damp today, it's an amazing place. Yeah. And and I, I just closed my eyes and I think of Afghanistan as being very mountainous as well, but just a, you know, country full of rubble. Yeah, so that deployment was a, a really interesting one for me and the fact that um, I was working in the Pentagon at the time and got farmed out as what's called an individual augmentee. So all these staffs that our military had established in Afghanistan required staff officers to do functions. So I got sent originally to Combined Forces Command Afghanistan, which was a amalgamation of military personnel from a lot of different coalition countries, uh, all working on various things to help stabilize Afghanistan and mostly the government of Afghanistan. So I was part of um, the intelligence section and my job was to be the targeting officer. And at the time they were trying to get Taliban. It, wait, what does that mean? So it, it means different things depending on what you're actually working towards. So targeting at this point for that headquarters was we were targeting Taliban and we were targeting people of really they were just warlord thugs who had come to places of power uh, and we were targeting them to reconcile with the government of Afghanistan. 
So I worked on a team to get them to reconcile with the government and turn in their stockpiles of weapons. And that became my function for about two months. So how do you do that? I mean, like if you have a bunch of pissed off thugs, as you put it, right? And they've got a bunch of weapons and you're going over and saying, lay down your weapons. So is it cash? I mean, how are you persuading these people? Yeah. So there, there were incentives for many of them to join the government, which was really kind of bizarre to me. Cause here you have these, you know, thugs that operated through the rule of the gun. Many of them were highly corrupt, but many of them were being recruited to reconcile with the government to become part of the government. They were trying to fill all these parliamentary seats and they were trying to fill all of these uh, cabinet level positions within President Karzai's government. So if they would turn in their stockpiles of tanks and weapons, um, they would get a seat at the table. So many of them were willing to trade their guns uh, and their prominence as warlords for prominence in this developing government structure Mm -hmm. that we were helping them build. So myself and this British officer, you know, and I, I kind of volunteered my services to work with him and go out to all these sites and go to these ceremonies where all these warlords were turning in their stockpiles of weapons and, uh, and then delivering them to the agencies that were counting them and storing them or destroying them. But our function was to go sit down with these warlords and receive them into the government. So when you're sitting down, okay, I'm just, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm in a movie right now, right? And because I, I can't imagine that you're, you're, you're going down and, you know, it's like this guy says to you, hey, Brian, where are we going? Oh, we're going to go meet a bunch of warlords. Great. So that yep. number one scare the shit out of me. Number two is I just, you know, see like there's this circle and I don't know if you're passing the peace pipe around or, you know, like how that all goes down. And when you're sitting in it, is it a surreal moment? It's completely surreal. Like in Eastern Afghanistan, you know, we were going to places where most people like us have never been. I mean, super isolated, protected by these warlords and their fighters. And, um, you know, the Soviets had had a hell of a time against the, the Afghans in these parts of the country. And here I am sitting surrounded by mountains in these valleys going to a ceremony that wasn't too much unlike a ceremony back here, you know, in Western civilization. Uh, and it, it was just bizarre. Like these Afghans are turning over tanks, you know, and we would show up and the streets would be lined with all these Afghans and they're all holding their personal AKs or PKMs and RPGs as we're driving down the street, hmm. but they're cheering and we're going into these ceremonies and it's bizarre to be in this ceremonial event, but the entire time I'm on hyper alert that this could go bad at yeah. any time. And it's me, some Afghan officials, this British officer that I was with, and a couple of other uh, guys that we had gathered up to be a security detail for us. And that was it. In the middle of nowhere, these Afghan villages. So totally surreal, totally new for me to be involved in in mission sets like that. Each one of these different uh, focuses, for lack of a better word, that you were in, because you were in the military for a long time, and and going back and doing some of the research, it seemed like you were always being elevated to kind of new challenges that were out there, right? And through each one of these challenges, again, going back to this bucket, and the bucket's full of all these great attributes around being an honorable man, were you constantly being surrounded by other world-class people that really knew their craft and and attention to detail and like had all these great characteristics that you were picking up along the way? Yeah, absolutely. So once I got through my initial schooling uh, and got my occupational specialty as at that time was a, uh, a ground intelligence officer. So that meant my pathway was to probably go lead uh, a sniper platoon as a platoon commander or a reconnaissance platoon, which at the time in the Marine Corps Uh, was seen as the elite of the elite within the Marine Corps. Kind of their their units that were 
capable of executing special operations, but organic to the Marine Corps. Um, so that's what I pursued. I pursued reconnaissance because I saw it as the best Marines to surround myself with, the ones willing to take on the hardest training, the toughest training, and the toughest missions. And that's how recon was seen at the time. That was my perception of them. And that's absolutely what I found when I made it to my first reconnaissance unit. The guys were wicked smart. They were crazy fit. They pushed themselves physically to limits I had never seen before. And I wanted to be a part of that. And they pushed me as the officer way more than I ever pushed them. And I absorbed everything. You know, that first platoon sergeant I had in recon, to this day, I still call him my sensei. Hmm. He taught me so much about how to lead others, how to give them respect, how to earn their respect and their trust and confidence. And those early formative years in reconnaissance kind of set me on that trajectory for the rest of my career. Well, that was that career. So now it's 2014 and you retire, yeah. right? After a long decorated career in the military, all kinds of awards and medals. And now you're saying the same thing that you said yourself many years back. Now what? Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I kind of thought I was doing all the right things, leaving the military um, on my terms. A lot of times people will hang on in the military until the military says, thanks for your service, but we no longer have a spot for you on the team. I chose not to do that. I relinquished battalion command in 2014 and made the conscious decision to leave on my terms and retire the same day I relinquished battalion command. And I did so for my family. Um, I had conducted so many deployments uh, and drug them through really a span of about eight years where I was never really present. I was there occasionally, but mentally I was focused on my job and I was focused on the upcoming deployment and training and preparing Marines to do, to do their job while deployed. So I wasn't present uh, and my kids were getting older. They now had perspective of time. Uh, when they were really young and I was gone, you know, my wife could be masterful at filling that void with different activities and they didn't really understand time. But now they understood what six months or eight months looked like. So that period really wore my family down. It wore me down. I was exhausted. Um, so I decided to leave. But again, thinking I was doing everything right, I had a great job lined up in San Diego to be the chief of operations for a 20 plus year old uh, commercial construction company. And I stepped into that role thinking, man, this is awesome. Only to find myself hating it every single day and feeling lost again in life, despite the fact I'm making great money, living in San Diego, my kids had stability, but I was the one suffering, you know? Part of it was my own ego. And every time I would see my peers get promoted to the next rank, thinking, man, that could have been you. You should be getting promoted again right now. You should be moving up in your next leadership assignment. You should be, you should be. And then my wife said, you're right where you should be. You should be with your family, your kids. We're done. Leave it behind. Move forward. Mm -hmm. So... That's what I continuously tried to tell myself is that's where you need to be. But for about a year and a half, I struggled through that. Well, there, there, there's, there's no question there was this huge brotherhood yeah. um, that share a common bond between athletes who've been in the locker room, could be any sport. Yep. In my case, football, you know, you just, it just it vanishes, right? Yeah. It goes out. And with you, with all your platoons, with, you know, hooking up with guys in Afghanistan, I mean, it's just the whole thing. You just go from this very exciting life to this very normal life. And, and you know, I mean, I was, I was never in the military, but I used to call my civilian life right after the right. NFL. It's just like, what? You know, like, it's just, it's not even about playing the game. It's about, it's about all the other intangibles that, that play into that, right? Yeah, that magical right. myth. So... 
So you're 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 down there and you're in this life that now you don't really think you should be in, even though on paper it looks pretty sweet. Yeah, to everyone else it looked great. You know, my peers in the military were like, Man, Vaughn just landed a sweet gig. <laughs> you know, he got to stay in San Diego. Man, he's killing it in the civilian world. And I was dying on the inside. And uh and I imploded in that process. And um I needed to break contact from that job, from that environment. I was still really close to the Marine Corps base there at Camp yeah. Pendleton. And I was just constantly surrounded by it, and it was always in my face. So after, uh, you know, really imploding, I told my wife, I said, I need to relocate. I need space. I need to heal. I need to not be constantly reminding myself about loss, about loss of identity, about the loss of people I served with, about not being a part of that team, that unit anymore. Let's break contact. And she said, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go to Idaho. <laughs> I, I find peace in the mountains. <laughs> yeah. I hated the ocean. The ocean to me was always pain, suffering, freezing cold. Yeah. And I loved the mountains because of the solitude and just the peaceful nature of being in the mountains. So you're in Boise now. Yep. So we live uh, just outside of Boise in Eagle, Idaho. Yeah. So how did that... Okay. So that's, that's what you needed to do, yeah. right? But there's more people involved in this than just you. Totally. So you got your wife and you got your two kids. Yep. Right? So my wife, watching me go through this, you know, imploding process, said, look, when you were in the Marines, I told you, I'll follow you anywhere. She came back and said that same thing. Look, if you're telling me this is right, she's like, I've, I've gambled with you now for, you know, at the time it was about 15 years of marriage. She's like, I've gambled with you that long. I'll gamble with you on this. And, um, uh, we can pack up, we'll uproot, and we'll move to a completely foreign place, and uh, we'll give it a shot. And if we don't like it, we can move. You know, you we, 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 I asked you about your bucket of, of you know, this whole concept around, around being an honorable man, right? And you gave me all these different characteristics, and there's, there's a bucket for her, too. Oh, yeah. And there's, there's loyalty, there's trust. Right. There's there's a bunch of stuff in there that, um, you know, boy, you got a good woman. Yeah. Well, throughout my entire military career, she displayed all of those things that encapsulate being honorable. You know, she's my role model today. Everything that she did while I pursued this this awesome career in the military. She, like so many military spouses, she took care of the kids. She took care of the finances. She took care of the problems. She took care of things when the house, you know, things broke in the house. Like she dealt with all of it. I deployed. I did my job. I took care of my Marines. She took care of everything else. And in the end, when she asked me to hang it all up and be more present in their lives, and I did it, she recognized that sacrifice. She probably knew it was going to be really hard for me to process and move on in life. And in that moment where I said, I need to move on, I need to, to relocate somewhere else, she went for it with me. She's a partner, completely loyal, and saw I was in a point of desperation. Yeah, that's awesome. Let's talk about ultra solutions. Yeah. So now you come to Idaho looking for a, a new beginning, and, and somewhere along the, the journey in this, you start this company called Ultra Solutions. So yeah. let's talk about what that does. Yeah, so I, I started Ultra Solutions when we were still in San Diego. You know, a, a lot of folks depart the military and create a business, you know, a consulting business or something. And I followed that path. I wanted to work for me um, and, and give people a sense of everything that I was about. But when we relocated here, um, I didn't know anyone, but happened to meet a guy that had been a, a special operations pilot, and he had just been hired on by the Albertson Family Foundation uh, in Boise, Idaho. Um, so we had a common bond of special operations, and he told me that he had just come on board with them to start a program to provide support to transitioning military veterans and their spouses. 
So he and I started talking. I had this company that was a consulting company. I had been on the board of directors for a military nonprofit uh, and helped start one. So I had a little bit of experience with helping others transition. And I had processed what I have been through transitioning myself now um, over the course of a couple of years at this point and offered my consulting services to them. And they took me up on it. Mm. And I spent about four and a half years with them creating programs uh, and all of those programs geared towards assisting military veterans and their spouses transition successfully here in Idaho. There's this one word that you have, and I love this word because um, in a sense, I never thought of it this way, but um, it's essentially what all my coaches who are coaching me um, help, you know, the people they coach do, which is optimize people. So I think that's a lot of what you're trying to do is get the best out of everybody that is at their craft, you know, versus just mailing it in half ass, um, trying to get the best. I'm sure that's part of the programming, right? That you yeah, go through, right? Absolutely. So I never intended to spend four and a half years working with the same organization. It just worked out great. And I found such purpose in that work we were doing. Um, and I was optimizing these people and their talents. And part of our methodology was to kind of be counter culture to a lot of what everyone else was hearing about veterans all being broken and non-conforming. I wanted to and we wanted to showcase them as positive members of their communities and highly successful in their endeavors post-military service. So that's, we tried to optimize the narrative about these people and at the same time optimize them in the paths they're choosing post-military service. Yeah, that's great. We're sitting here today in the higher ground offices. So I want to understand what your connection is to higher ground. Yeah, so I first uh, encountered higher ground uh, when I moved here. I got invited to their annual you know, fundraising gala uh, called Hero's Journey. And that was my initial introduction to the organization. And then I came up and they kind of showcased some of the work they did and took me through some of the things they do with adaptive athletes or military veterans that had suffered some sort of uh, physical trauma. And I was very moved by what I witnessed, the work they do, and um, have maintained a relationship with people on the team here at Higher Ground. And then um, most recently started working with them on their development efforts um, and helping grow their programming and helping them reach other people in a broader sense uh, that could utilize what this organization does. Uh, I think you've got my buddy Jim Mora now part of that team, which is great. Yep. Uh, so he'll be a great asset. Uh, I'll go back to where I started in terms of when I was talking about, you know, some of the different things that I'm involved in. And, and one of the great um, moments of my life is when I threw this event last January and it was called Amelia's Everest. So it was dedicated after my daughter, um, all the money going to and proceeds going to um, uh, the Epilepsy Foundation. Great, great foundation. But higher ground to me, you know, just made a lot of sense for me to kind of realign who I'm working with uh, in terms of trying to bring money and awareness to just because they're here, they're that the, the resources in terms of people are so much greater um, and it's really hands-on and that's really what I'd love to do. I, you know, there's one thing to give money and the other thing to, to, you know, where I can jump in, just like what you're saying, be involved, not just, you know, from a financial standpoint, but from, you know, getting your hands dirty in there. So a uh, higher ground has come together and anybody wants to, to donate to this great cause, Amelia's Everest, the Load Seat Challenge, they'll be going up Mount Everest and then come down for a few hours, jump in a tent, and then go back up the fourth highest mountain in the world, Load Seat. And hopefully I can pull that up. But the, the, the top of the mountain is 27,940 feet, and we're trying to match those dollars, and we're certainly well on our way uh, there, $17,000 plus. So you can find that uh, donation tab on my website, uh, NFL. And, um, you know, any donation, any amount counts. So it's great to be involved. It's great to be podcasting people like you. It is a hero's journey. So I'm thankful for you coming on the pod today. Where can people find you? Yeah, so they can find me on social media, uh, either at Ultra Solutions 
uh, or Brian dot Vaughn, uh, is a handle of mine. And then, um, you know, I'm on all the platforms except Twitter. Uh, cause I think that one just gets so cluttered. I just stay away from it. Um, and they can go to my website, ultrasolutions.com and, uh, see what I'm doing there. That's great. That's great. All right, man. I appreciate you coming on the pod. Thank you so much. Inspirational to all. And uh, just another phenomenal guest on, on these things I'm trying to do. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, buddy. Take care. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So... Until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.